The Terrifying Lies Podcast, with music and stories by Craig Nibo. Greetings, friends, and welcome to a special episode of The Terrifying Lies Podcast. It's June 14th, the night of a full moon. For those astrologers out there, June's full moon is known as the Strawberry Moon. I plan in the future to release a special episode of Terrifying Lies at midnight on every full moon of every month. These midnight episodes will come at you from a different angle. I plan to bring in a special guest and allow him or her to tell his or her story. For tonight, I'm happy to present an exclusive interview with none other than Victor Frankenstein. But before we get into it, I want to make sure you know about the huge project that I've launched on Kickstarter. It's called Tesla v. Cthulhu, a musical. You can back the project and pick up a copy of the musical soundtrack on vinyl or CD, autographed of course, by visiting kickstarter.com and searching for Tesla v. Cthulhu. I encourage you to check it out. I'm extremely proud of this project, and I know you will love it. In fact, listen to this. It's science versus magic. It's brains versus pan-galactic might. It's scientists versus cultists. And the Earth itself hangs in the balance. It's Tesla v. Cthulhu, a musical. Nikola Tesla lived in his laboratory on Knob Hill, outside of Colorado Springs, where he and his assistant, Fritz Lowenstein, lit up the sky with lightning they shot from a tower. Tesla wanted to send messages through the air and turn the Earth into a giant battery. Fritz didn't like how Tesla treated him. Tesla made Fritz empty the incinerator traps, scrape carbon buildup from the dynamos. Tesla even made Fritz massage his toes so he could think clearly while trying to conduct his experiments. One night, Fritz quit. He visited his best friend, Hercule, at the Carronade Tavern in town. He told Hercule that he didn't want to work for Tesla anymore. Meanwhile, Alice, the lovely lady who worked at the local telegraph office, received a weird message that didn't come through the wires. Instead, this message came through the air. The message said, Eminent danger, stop. Go the lightning wood and tower, stop. Because the message didn't come through the telegraph wires, Alice knew that Tesla had sent it from a place in the woods where he liked to test his wireless message system. She snatched up the message and left the telegraph office. Alice found Fritz and Hercule at the Carronade Tavern. She convinced them to go to the Lightning Woods, Tesla's special testing place in the forest, to see why Tesla had sent the message. The man serving drinks told Fritz, Hercule, and Alice that many townspeople had seen three witches in Colorado Springs. He said these three witches probably wanted to hurt Tesla. The man serving drinks gave them a giant cannon that he kept hung up behind the bar, some gunpowder, an iron ball, and a long cable. He said Alice and her friends might need these things if they ran into the three witches. When Alice and her friends reached Tesla's special testing place, they saw the witches. Tesla stood before them, tied to two electric towers Fritz helped build. Alice and her friends hid in the woods to watch the witches. The witches wanted to summon an evil god from outer space named Cthulhu to take over the world. The witches hoped to become powerful and help Cthulhu to dominate everyone on the planet. Alice and her friends watched the witches cast a spell that made Cthulhu appear. But Cthulhu couldn't take over the world because he looked like a man, only with green skin, tentacles, and red eyes, although he wore a snappy suit. To take over the world, Cthulhu had to become big and mighty, the three witches would have to sacrifice Tesla 
and cast another spell. Tesla tried to argue with Cthulhu, but tied to the two electric towers, he couldn't stop Cthulhu or the witches from exacting their evil plans to overthrow the world. Tesla needed help. Cthulhu sparkled with energy, but the three witches knew that this energy wouldn't last long. They had to cast another spell to make Cthulhu big and mighty. The witches said magic words and drew scary knives from their pockets. They closed in on Tesla. Alice and her friends ran out of the trees just before the three witches could sacrifice Tesla. Alice used a branch to keep the witches away while Hercule tied his cable to one of Tesla's towers and fastened the other end to a cannonball. Fritz put his hands on the switch that would release lots of power from Tesla's towers. He told Hercule to hurry up or the witches and Cthulhu would sacrifice his friend and take over the world. Hercule and Fritz counted to three. Hercule fired the cannonball into the sky at the exact moment Fritz pulled the lever. The whole area, earth and sky, exploded into a blast of electromagnetic and supernatural fire. Witnesses heard the deafening roar of magic clashing with energy all the way from Colorado Springs. The light in the sky shined bright enough to sunburn those who saw it, even though the maelstrom erupted in the middle of the night. After the blast subsided and the sky became calm, everyone lay on the ground when the dust settled, overtaken by the energy and excitement that had transpired. Alice woke up first. She noticed that Cthulhu had vanished. Soon, the others roused. Slowly, one by one, they regained their feet. Once reoriented with their surroundings, Tesla and his friends faced off with the three witches of Cthulhu. They shouted at each other. Tesla said science overpowered magic. The three witches said magic could beat science. Finally, the three witches left, but before they walked into the forest, Jerusha raised her finger in the air and declared that they would return for revenge. And when they came back, they would bring the power of the great old ones with them to trample over the entire world. Alice, Hercule, Fritz, and Tesla rejoiced. They'd stop Cthulhu from making everybody into sad, enslaved people. Fritz even decided to go back to work for Tesla. Together, they hoped they could make the whole world into an enormous battery that would give free power to both the rich and the poor. I now present to you, from the ship of Captain Robert Walton, an exclusive interview with Mr. Victor Frankenstein. We're aboard the ship of Captain Robert Walton, writer and explorer. Surprisingly far from civilization and near the most northern reaches of the planet Earth, Walton's crew has just saved a man from death. They found Victor Frankenstein, along with his sled adrift on an ice floe, and have pulled him aboard. Now warm and with food in his belly, Dr. Frankenstein sits across the table from me. He's agreed to an interview. I'm, I'm, I'm not as... I'm not a doctor. I'm all but dissertation. At the, I went to Ingolstadt for you know for, for my for my learning, but never completed. So no, I'm that is actually a misnomer. I'm not a I'm not technically a doctor. Okay, well, uh, I stand corrected on that. You're going to have to pardon me because every time I've heard anyone refer to you, they've referred to you as Doctor Frankenstein. So is it Mister Frankenstein? Well, I mean, you could call me ABD Frankenstein, but uh, you could just you could call me Vic. I don't know. That's that's what Perval used to call me. Okay. Okay. Vic it is. Well, Vic, let's start out at the beginning. Tell me about your childhood, your origin. Um, I've, I grew up on the uh, 
uh, the banks of uh, uh, Lake Geneva, and um, I, I had a, a, a very, very kind and loving mother and father, um, and really they they did not have um, um, did not give me much to to want, and I uh, grew up on these beautiful shores, and um, uh, when when I was about eight years old, um, we were we were traveling and we. Uh, found a, a young girl named Elizabeth that my my parents actually presented to me as my own, um, and, but uh, she she grew up with me as as my my cousin, and so and then I had my my uh, my good my good friend Creval. Uh, we we would um, so it was Elizabeth Creval and I would just would just spend like um, hours and hours and days just going through through just this beautiful nature, and I'm um, just learning to. To love the world and, and to love life and and understand how you know how great and uh, um, uh, 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 um, uh, majestic 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 sure, that majestic. That, uh, that nature is. So my English, uh, I speak several languages. English is one of them, but I, I have not used it in quite some time. So well, your English is very good. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, feel secure in in uh, in what you're saying. You sound great. Okay, well, let's talk. Let's get into it a little bit. You are, uh, you're a chemist, and you're inspired by galvanism. Can you, can you educate us a little bit on chemistry and galvanism? Well, it's, um, I, I studied under a man, I studied uh, the books of a man named Agrippa, and uh, he's, he's ancient uh, philosopher. He, he, he studied uh, what is called natural philosophy. And uh, it is, uh, when, when I was, when I was young, I uh, we, were, we were playing in a in a rainstorm, and uh, a, uh, a a a bolt of lightning came down and just completely destroyed the, a tree. And for one minute there's a tree there, next minute no tree, and I I realized that there is this uh, this this, this um, incredible power with electricity, and um, uh, I I started uh, looking into this uh, to, to Electricity being this um, philosopher's stone, this uh, this secret to to uh, the hidden part of life, and um, at the at the time, you know, we could take uh, we could take electricity and put it through uh, the uh, uh, a frog who who's who's dead, and we could make the muscles move again. That's but amazing. I, yeah, but I but that's this is the the, the galvanism uh, that that you uh, that you mentioned and. Um, I was thinking, I was hoping that like we could take this and actually uh, uh, use Agrippa's you know, philosophies and mix um, um, you know, a little bit of uh, science with a little bit of the, the natural philosophies of what you call um, a, a, a cult, um, not the milk that makes your stomach good, but um, the, the occult that uh, and try to make a little magic into it and uh, try to bring back life. Um, and try to restore life, uh, and not just make you know the, the, the froggies move. I mean that's something Jim Hansen could do. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, you, so we just go with that. Okay, excellent. Well, obviously you explored this to great depth, and ended up doing something amazing. And uh, I, I kind of want to know what the origins of that are. Like, what inspired you to actually create a sapient creature? Well. Um, uh, it was it was the, uh, the, the the death of of, of my mother. Um, she uh, my um, uh, my Elizabeth. She took she took ill, and um, my my mother took care of her. And where Elizabeth got better, uh, my my mother actually got much much worse. And and uh, right before I went to uh, to Ingolstadt to uh, to, to study uh, at the college, um, she she died. And it was that sort of, that sort of moment, almost like lightning hitting the tree, that I had this realization that I needed to um, basically uh, st- focus my studies to uh, overcome this death, and uh, basically, yes, to, to bring back my my mother. I mean, Freud would have a field day with this, but uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Well, okay, so that it sounds like your studies were. Well intentioned. Well, and, as, yeah, as you know, as as all you know, good good intentions go bad. Uh, this this one definitely did go bad. I I uh, I left Elizabeth. I left uh, my father. 
and my brothers and um, and and the uh, and uh, Carval and I, I went to Ingolstadt and I started uh, 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 studying under um, uh, under under my professor's uh, tutelage, uh, uh, Waldman, my professor Waldman. Uh, he was uh, very very helpful in uh, encouraged this uh, uh, this natural philosophy, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he. Uh, and so I kind of did some things um, in, in secret. And I started going to charnel houses and uh, started doing my own research and, and, and finding these um, you know, dead bodies and pots and stuff like that. And, and I figured that I could make, uh, not only overcome death, but actually um, improve upon uh, the, the physical form to, to make it so that we would not be susceptible you know, to these diseases of uh, mortality. So, can you take us through the steps from zero to creature? What was the process you went to in order to bring, you know, a, a, in essence, dead tissue to life and have it think and reason? What was the process? Well, well, first, first, I, you know, I, I get, I get the body parts, and I, uh, it, it was much easier to make something that was larger than, um, you know, than, than the, than the natural human form because just easier to work with just bigger you know sort of a thing and uh, I could and so I got these parts and started you know stitching them together and, and um and putting them together and um uh, uh, it was um, uh, a, a big I don't I yada 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 it came to life I, I yada 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 because I don't want others to know my secrets and because I don't want others to make the mistakes that I did and so if, if I went into detail and, you know, and described it, um, then others would, would follow my path. And I, I do not want that because it was, it was, not, a very, it was not a very good path. But I will, I will say that at the time, I, I thought that I was making this beautiful creature, that I was making this thing that was like the statue of David, that was just like this, this, uh, this beautiful heavenly angel being that was laying down there on the slab and, until it was like this November. It's November evening, and it was very stormy out, and um, I, I, I was putting it all together, and I finally pulled that switch and sensed the electricity through its body, and it opened its eye, and it was like everything just melted away, and I saw the creature for what it was. It was, was not some sort of angelic being. It was, it, was, it was just awful. It was this horrendous creature, this this yellow eye that opened up and, and looked at me. And it, it had this black hair and it just it was just ugly. And I realized that I had offended nature, this this beings that I that I worshipped and just loved so much. And I had just take I had told nature that, you know, that I am better than you. And I I, I ran. I, I went into this other room and just swooned. Wow. Well, okay, so nobody has seen this creature, except maybe you and a few people. And we're going to get into some of the consequences of you bringing life to this creature later. But I, I think you're the only one, really, who has set eyes on this creature and beheld it to any amount of detail. Anyone else has, who has beheld it has most likely come to a, a, a terrible fate. Can you, for the for the sake of those out there who want to know what this creature looks like, can you kind of give us sort of a scale of, uh, you know, describe this creature? Uh, he, he is, he's about uh, eight, eight feet tall in, in height, and uh, he has this sort of pale um, skin, a uh, very, um, uh, uh, very, very ugly skin, uh, not full with life, like, like you or I, we have, we have skin, very uh, very pale, uh, black hair, um, and uh, he he speaks French very well, actually. Um, he he learns that from uh, observing uh, a family named the De Lacy's. Um, We're going to talk about the De Lacy's. Yeah, we'll talk about. Okay, we talk about them. Uh, yeah, so he's uh, he he is not he is not like um, uh, you you would think that he would be depicted with like you know a flat head and bolts coming out of the the neck and the the, the green. The green skin. I, 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 I don't. I do not know where the green skin is from. You know, it's 
it's funny, uh, without any context at all whatsoever, ever in my life, that's the image that comes to my mind. Flathead bolts coming out. Ugh. Ugh. It's a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what amazes me even more than the physicality of this creature is that you actually raised a being from the dead or created a being from parts, uh, from dead parts, that uh, is enormous, but it also is sentient. This thing can think. This thing can reason. I'm curious about the the psychiatry of this, the psychology of this creature. What is it like in its mind? How does its mind work? Well, I, I think I think what happened was was that the um, I, I took dead parts, you know, from you know for for the muscles and the organs and, and stuff like that. But I also took dead parts for the brain, um, and and so um, there there are different there are different parts in in the brain that do different things. And um, I took different uh, different brains and sort of like uh, um, b- uh, put them together and so uh, the, the creature most likely has some sort of um, uh, what, you, what you call it latent latent memories of uh, its past lives of, of what it would be and so it, it came out not knowing anything but being able to like uh, like learn language very very quickly and very um, 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 which with, with much more ease than you know somebody else trying to learn a, a language or a second language. Um, to where it would just be sort of awakening those areas of the brain that once knew, you know, these these languages. That's, so that is astounding. And so it is. It is a very it, uh, the, the creature. Uh, we we think of the creature as I, I, I mean I think of the creature as very you know very big and very strong and very powerful and physically superior to to you or I it is able to like climb like the sheer cliffs of mountains or eat like sticks and berries and stuff to to sustain itself and and we always think about how hearty you know I, I always think about how hearty this this creature is but it is also incredibly intelligent also because it has all of this, this, this maybe prior knowledge. I, I'm not sure how this works, but it seems it is my best uh, hypothesis hmm. on how this creature is so smart and so um, so much superior in its thinking to you know to to normal man. Well, you know, you you alluded earlier to uh, things not working out well. You you alluded to consequences from uh, creating this creature, and you even said that. When the creature opened its eye, you expected this creature to be an angel. Those were your words, an angelic being. But you said that a type of horror filled your soul, a kind of aberration toward this creature, and you fled. Now, most scientists, I would think, would be completely proud of such an accomplishment. I mean, bringing life from nothing is nothing short of amazing. Why were you immediately repulsed by this cornerstone event in scientific history? It, it was um, it was the realization that I had committed heresy against nature, and that what what, what I had done was was blasphemous um, to you know to her, and I, I should not have I should not have done it. Okay, so you, the creature opens its eyes, you feel this sense of dread, this sense of going against the grain of light of nature, and you leave. What, where did you go? Did you walk the streets? Did you go to a friend's? What, no, what, I, what I happened just, that night? I, I just went into uh, the other room at first, and I, um, I wake up and I see um, the creature standing in front of me, and it was... Uh, it was raising its hand towards me and and it beckoning me and all, all I could do is just like just scream in horror. Whether I screamed out louder in my head, I, I, I don't know. Um, and it there, there was this sort of um, uh, madness that took over me and I, uh, there, there's uh, sort of a blur of events, but I, uh, the creature, it, uh, it, it left. It, it, it realized that it was scorned. And, you know, it reached out to me and, 
you know, for I've, I've, I suppose I was, it's in, in a sense, it's father, uh, but, uh, but um, I was, I, I rejected, you know, my, um, my creation, my, my son, I don't know. Um, and I, I went, uh, I, I found myself later on the streets um, after this sort of delirium, this, this blur, and a coach, uh, you know, pulled up. And my and for, uh, uh, my, my friend Craval had had come out of this coach. I had not seen him uh, in in months because I had sort you know I had sort of uh, abandoned you know everything around me. I hadn't written my you know my, my family and my friends, and they had no idea if I was in good health or in bad health. And so um, he he comes and he finds me on the streets, and he's so excited, and I did not know if it was uh, some sort of dream or this is reality or, you know, or what. But then he, he takes me and he, and he wants to take me back, you know, to my, to my, my room. And I was very against this because I, I did not know where this, this creature was. Did not know if it was in, the, in you know, back at the house or, you know, um, down at the park or whatever. It's, and so I, uh, but he, he got me back and, um, and then I uh, sort of swooned for about six months. I uh, just just stayed in bed. It was uh, not not very not very good. But yeah. Oh wow! That the consequence of that hit you so deep. I, I can only empathize with what you were going through. Meantime, while you're in bed for six months, this creature has to go somewhere. Has to interact with people. Has to somehow find its place in society and it occurs to me that this creature is more or less uh, a childlike being no life experience other than latent memories uh, to speak of and i'm just i'm theorizing here but what happened to this creature where did it go how did it educate itself what happened well um it, uh it, it told me its it, it story will we get to that later of course um, but, uh, so I know, I know somewhat of what, what happened with him while, while I was, um, in, in bed. So while, while I was in bed recovering, uh, the creature, he goes out and he tries, uh, he, he's, uh, trying to find a sense of community, trying to find, you know, a, a family, some, some, uh, someone like him in order for him to feel like he belong. And, uh, the creature, he he finds a young girl who's lost in the woods and her, her, her father and her brother are looking for her, but she fell into this river and she was drowning. And so the creature, he jumped in and saved her and pulls her out just as he's, you know, walking, you know, from and into the shore with this, with this young girl in, in his arms. Um, the, the father and the, and the brother like yell at the creature and to thank him, they shoot him uh, because they do not understand that he was there to save the girl. And so he is, he is scorned uh, by, uh, by these people that should be thanking him. So um, there's, there's a few other incidents that happens, but he ends up in a, uh, in a hovel next to a, uh, a cabin. And there is these Delacy's who live in the cabin. And... Um, he can kind of look through a little, a little chink in in the in the wall, and see into the cabin, and um, there there is uh, uh, Felix, one the, the the young the young boy. He uh, uh, he is very sad for some reason, and the creature notices his you know his sadness, and then he becomes very happy when he gets a letter, and then soon after a young girl named Safe, uh, she comes in. But she speaks, you know, uh, no, no French, and so she, um, so, uh, so the, so the, uh, the creature, uh, so they, the Delacys, uh, teach Safi, uh, this, you know, language, and the creature just picks up on it. It's like he, he looking through, through wall and like learning about numbers and letters. It's, it's very, very much like your Sesame Street, uh, to where you know you, you can see these things going on. And uh, he, can, he could learn the language. He learns very, very quickly, much, much better than, uh, much, much faster, I should say, than, than, than Safe. Um, and so that's kind of where he, uh, you know, so 
Uh, that's where he learns, you know, to, to speak in, in the language. That is, that's astounding. Now, I've heard reports about this family living out in the country, living out in the woods. Um, it seems there are allegations and rumors on what happened, and the rumors don't seem to be good. Do you have any information on what actually happened out in those woods? So, yes. Uh, so the creature, he um, he is like good fairy that bring, you know, firewood and stuff like this to the family. And, and they just thought it was like some, you know, some sort of good spirit of the woods. And um, then, uh, so he tries to build trust, you know, to, uh, he tries to build trust with the, with uh, the Delacy's. And, um, but he... He noticed uh, that he, he could probably have uh, the best chance of um, uh, with, with the father. And, and why is that? Uh, the father was blind. Oh. And so could not see his, his horrible visage. Um, and, and so he, he wait until um, his, his son and daughter and daughter-in-law uh, like leaves the cabin. And um, uh, the creature comes in and uh, starts uh, and, and starts to implore this the fa- this father uh, as to you know to to help him that he is you know he is the, the one thing in his life that can um, uh, you know that, that can save him but it is very unfortunate because you know the children uh, they come home uh, early from from their walk and um, uh, the thing, things went bad and Felix uh, like started uh, uh, started to tear at the creature and, and, and whip him with, with, uh, with a stick. And which to me just seems, I mean, uh, not, you know, eight foot creature, you know, next to your father, he had a very strong instinct to protect his, his, uh, his kinship. And the creature could have just torn him limb from limb, that, you know, just grab him and pull his arms off and then beat him with arms, etc. Uh, but, uh, but the creature just left he was scorned. He, he like leaves, and then he uh, he uh, he noticed that the family like uh, uh, they the Delacys they just pack up and go, and so um, the the creature is just is just angry, and he um, like in uh, Talking Heads he burns down house, and uh, he uh, and he just dances around this fire because it's just it's his sort of revenge. And he, you know, he, he cannot c- create life, but he can create death. And that just seems to be, you know, what he does best. Well, it seems like this creature, at least at one point, had a sense of empathy for humans. He tried to save a girl from the river, the little girl. Yeah. And he actually has a sense of at least longing for family, for kinship. And so he tried to befriend this family. So he's twice scorned. And I, I, I kind of want you to go a little bit into depth on how you think this all affected the creature. What went through this creature's mind uh, to switch him from this creature of empathy? I mean, what's going on in this creature's head at this point? Uh, well, he, uh, he, he approached me. He just he wants someone like him, and he he wants me to. Uh, he wanted me to, like, um, since he could not befriend someone, you know, of, of our kind, he wanted me to uh, basically make him a second, uh, a, a mate. So you're saying you actually were face-to-face with this creature at this point? Yeah, yes. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, did, I did meet with, uh, with the creature. Um, I, we were... Uh, I, I, I followed him, and I found him, and um, he was uh, uh, on Mount Blanc. And uh, I, I packed up my ass with, uh, with, with goods and, uh, and uh, went up Mount Blanc with my ass, and um, like donkey. Uh, and so, uh, so we get, I get to the top, and, um, I have a, and he has a fire in a little cave, and he tells me the story. That's, that's why I know, you know, this, this, this tale of the Delacy's. Um, and... Um, he he told me his tale and tried to make me feel empathetic towards his cause. And then he he said, "I want you to make a creature just as horrifying as I am, and I promise you that if you um, if uh, if if you make this creature, 
uh, that uh, this mate, then I will be happy and I will go away to like Argentina. And so, and so I thought that's that pretty good deal. It's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Did you take that deal? Uh, I, I started. Uh, I started on, on, on this, uh, this female creature. Um, um, I had to go back uh, to, uh, uh, to home, and then, we, uh, and then uh, Cleval came with me, and we went to uh, London. I had to get some more supplies. And, um, and then I ended up in uh, northern Scotland and some islands up there. Ah, and okay. um, I found a very, very nice remote uh, a hut on an island, and I started, I started to uh, to work on this, on this, this, this female, this mate, this, this um, uh, Eve, to to this Adam. Oh, okay. Before we get too far into that, and I know this might be difficult for you, but I wanted to talk about the execution of Justine Moritz. Uh, Justine, please do not make me talk about Justine. Well, and I know it's sensitive, but it seems to be an important part of your narrative, uh, in your memoir especially. Where does Justine fit in this story? My, my little brother, um, William, was killed by this creature. Um, and the, the creature uh, took a locket from William and put it into Justine's pocket. And... Um, Justine was uh, asleep at this time. They got caught in a rainstorm, and they went into this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, how you call it, this barn. And, and Justine falls asleep, and the creature sees little William, and he say, and he thinks to himself, I can, I can uh, take this, this child, and I can, you know, make him my friend. Um, but... Uh, William uh, re- rejects him and yells at him and, and uh, calls him all sorts of uh, bad names. Um, you know, a creature, a monster, poopy pants, you know how kids are. Oh, yeah. And um, the, uh, the creature uh, says, if you reject me, then I kill you. And so he did. And then he took the locket and gave it to, uh, put it in Justine's pocket. She was in, in the shed asleep. And um, she was... Uh, she was brought up on charges of, of murdering my, my, my brother. I, I knew better. I knew that it was this creature. Um, and Did you go to her aid? I, well, I was the only one that believed her because, you know, she said she was innocent. Um, but they, uh, they beat a confession out of her so that she, you know, would not go to hell. And... Um, I, I kept waiting to see if this was the right time to, to tell the magistrate, you know, what had really happened. Um, but I, I waited too long, and she, she was hung. Wow. So her, I mean, her death is, and William's death is actually on my hands also, yes. I, I try not to speak of it because, you know. Oh, okay, well, you have something in common with William. You both have the last name Frankenstein. Yeah. So does did this was William a target by the creature? Well, the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the creature he when he approached my little brother, you know, um, uh, my little brother uh, said, "Do you know who I am? My my father is uh, Monsieur Frankenstein," and uh, referring to um, our father, not and but the creature thought that it was me. It was very this this mistaken sort of. Uh, identity. He thought that it was his brother, that he was killing uh, much, I guess, uh, suppose like some sort of Cain and Abel, you know, sort of sort of a situation that he was thinking. Wow. So. Well, that's incredible, and I'm very sorry for your loss, Mr. Frankenstein. Let's get back to creating a mate for this monster. Seems like the pressure's on to create a mate. This creature has killed your brother at this point. How did this go? Creating this, uh, you've you've told me you're gathering supplies from New York. Continue London, that. S- London. London. Oh, London. Okay, London. Pardon me. You're gathering supplies from London. How's this going? Well, I was at Carval at the time, so it was very difficult for me to gather. So, you know, like, I mean, a, a trunk full of, like, you know, body parts is kind of hard to hide from your best friend. But, you know, I, I, I do it. 
Um, and uh, so he says he, that uh, that he will go on, and I uh, and I will I will meet him, you know, later on. And so we we depart, in um, and I go up to uh, to these islands, and um, the Orkney Islands, and uh, I start to create this creature because I realize that. This is the only way to, you know, to stop this creature. I did not want to do it. I mean, he's already killed my brother. He has already killed Justine. I mean, Justine. And these sorts of things were, uh, were weighing very, very heavily upon me. And, um, but he had promised me that if he, if he, if we were to make, if I was to make this creature for him, that he would leave. And, and so I thought, you know, that is is the way to basically make things right so that we can get rid of him and he can go away and then there was a certain point where i saw that the creature was watching me this whole time and i had come to a realization that i i had uh, i had a a promise from the creature but i did not have a promise from you know this this she uh, that i was making and she could just reject him, just as everyone else had. And that would probably send this creature into an even, you know, um, wider frenzy of blood. So I, I realized that what I was doing was once again defying nature, was, uh, was basically saying that I was better than nature once again. And I was uh, pulled back into that, that thing that I so d- despised about myself um, in the first, you know, in the first place. So I, I cut up the the, the, the creature, the she creature that I was making, and uh, put it into like into small bags, and um, put some rocks in the bags, and and got the rowboat, and went out into the ocean and uh, dumped all of the uh, all of the parts into the ocean. Yeah. Uh, okay, so but but you said you said your creature, your male creature, was watching you the whole time. Did your creature see you dispose of your new experiment? Of, just- of course, of course he did. He's, um, yeah, he he saw everything, and and I did it so that he could see that uh, that I was doing this. I I wanted him to see. Well, why didn't he? Why do you think he didn't kill you on the spot? Uh, there are, there are so many things out there that are worse than death. And what, what he wanted to do uh, would be to basically um, to torture me. And if I'm dead, then, I'm, then, I'm, then I am uh, dead. Basically, he says that he, is, that he uh, wanted to satiate the ma of death with the blood of my friends and family. And... Um, if I am dead, you know, then it is over. Um, and then he made me one promise, uh, because he knew that I was going to go back, um, and, uh, and marry, uh, my, my dear Elizabeth. And, uh, he, he said, I will be with you on your wedding night. Now, at that time, I thought that it would be all be over, that he would kill me. Um, but... I, I did not. I did not know that. What he truly meant by that. And, um, pardon me. It's okay, Victor. So I'm on the island, and I'm talking with the creature, and he he makes me these these horrible promises, and um, and so I go into his rowboat and um. And, and fall asleep. And after I throw these, these things into the into the ocean. Okay. Well, uh, I, according to according to your memoir, seems like you left. Seems like you sailed away. You sailed away. Where it is when you finally you you finally ended up in Ireland after this? Yes, I I've I've I uh, I fall asleep in in rowboat and and wake up in Ireland. And if you look at the map, it seems quite impossible that I would travel that far in that distance of time. Maybe maybe a creature told me something. I don't, I don't know. It seems, it seems very 
Very fanciful, so, that I would go that far in one evening. Right, right. That is astounding. But, according to sources, the police were there in Ireland waiting for you. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, show, they, they find some, uh, they find body on, 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 on the shore. And they accuse me of being the murderer. I have, I have no idea. I'm in boat. And, and so I, uh, and so I say, no, I, I, I do not know, uh, but, but you're talking about I'm in boat all day, uh, all night. And they say, um, that, uh, uh, that it is this person that I have killed, that, they, that there are witnesses that, that saw me. And I was like, I, I, I don't see how that is even possible because the, uh, because I was in boat. But, um, uh, so they they take me uh, to, uh, poli- to the police station and they show me the, the body and uh, excuse me I must pause before I move on before my heart is heavy with grief. Absolutely, take a minute, Victor. It it was it was my dear Clavel. Childhood friend. Yes. What happened to him? Um, he was he was obviously, to me obviously to me killed by the creature, and so I, I did not know what to do. I, I swooned. You swooned. I swooned. Hmm. Wow. It's what I do. It's what you do. You swoon. Yeah. It's, that's. I, I mean. Things would probably be better if I, you know, faced my challenges. But no, I, I ignore them and so. Well, did you go into hiding? Did you did you flee? Did you? No, I was in police custody. And did you go to prison for this? Yes, and so they they have me in prison, and I was, um, in in this swoony delirium for quite some time, and I finally wake up, and um, I uh, there is um, a nurse made there. And um, I, I wake up and I, th- I said, oh, I thought I was dead. And she goes, ah, yes, it'd be better that you were dead than, you know, than, than alive because Who, of what's going to happen. Who's uh, this she woman? Was, she was just a, an Irish, uh, she was just a, one, of, one, of the, um, uh, one of the caretakers uh, that, would, uh, that was taking care of me while I was uh, uh, swooning. And she's telling you that you're better off dead. Yes, and, and, and um, in, in her defense... And she was right. I, I would have been better off dead than, than, than alive to, uh, to go through, uh, you know, another court session. So you are in, you are in jail, yeah. charged with murder. The, the uh, falsely accused of the, the deaths of my, of my friend, Carval. This is an echo of Justine's, of Justine's situation. Yeah, very much so. So what was going through your head? Um... Is it, well, there's a certain point where I just, I just wanted it to be over. Because if I, if I could be dead, then I won't have to deal with this anymore. I guess death is the ultimate swoon. So how did you get out of this situation? Did you go to court? Well, Were you assigned counsel? Yeah, it, it, it's amazing how things can just go away sometimes. Um, and this was one of those situations. Um, the... Uh, the, the magistrate comes in and he says that someone is here to see me. And I thought he was meaning the creature. And I'm like, oh, no, not him, not him. do not anybody but him. And he says, and he, he is saying, why, why would you say this about your father? And my father had shown up. They had, they had written my father and he had come um, to Ireland to, to rescue me, basically. And... Uh, very, very interestingly, that when he showed up, all of a sudden, all of the charges were dropped. Hmm. So it worked out. You're out of jail. Yeah, for some mysterious reason, my fa- my very rich father shows up, and I just walk out. Well, in a way, that's fortunate, and in a way, that's unfortunate. Here you are, in a in a place worse than death, wanting to die. But yet, you're still responsible for the situation. You have this creature that you've released upon the earth, and you have an impending threat on you. You told me earlier that the creature said that he was going to visit you on your wedding night. 
Just... Did anything come of this? Um, well, yeah, yes. I mean, he did show up on my wedding night, and it was not to bring gift. Um, he's, um, uh, so I, I get, we get back to Lake Geneva, and, um, Elizabeth, uh, we, we get married, and we, um, we get in a rowboat and go across lake, um, and to a little cottage across lake, and, and that, that moment was, I, I think the last moment of my life that I would ever care to go back and look at with the smile. Because there was something beautiful in, in the water and the stars and in the mountains. And I could see that, you know, the, the beauty of nature and how I really had, um, you know, offended this beautiful thing, you know, by trying to improve upon it. But um, it was very calm and very serene. And then we, uh, we, we make to our, our, our cottage and... I go into the other room and I hear screaming. And I, I, I bust in and no, no surprise, it was the creature. And that was when I realized that when he said that I will be with you on your wedding night, that it was not to kill me, but it was to uh, destroy my last thread of happiness. My, when my, my father, he, he hears about this and he dies of heartbreak. And so it was, you know, I, lo I lose my, my cousin, uh, my, who is uh, uh, Elizabeth, my wife. Um, I lose my father, I lose everything. Um, and I, I feel alone in the world. I finally understand what the creature felt like. You know, I, I was alone, nobody, um, nobody believed me. I tried at that, you know, to to tell people, no, it was the creature. They, you know, people go out, they, and they look for the creature, but they'd not, they'd not find him. You know, he's, he, he eludes. Well, so what brought you from your wedding night to being found outside this ship on an ice floe? Well, um, so I, I, I make it that my, my resolve to, to kill creature. It's I brought him into this life, I can take him out of this life. And so I, my father said that to me many times. And so uh, I, I made it resolve to, um, to kill creature. And so I, 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 I uh, made a pact, I swear, at, at the, the grave of my brother, uh, Justine, uh, of my father, and... Uh, Elizabeth, I swear that I will bring justice back to, you know, to them and re re restore uh, n uh, balance in nature. And so I, uh, I follow the creature. Um, the creature leaves very obvious trail for me to, to follow him. He, 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 he toys me with me like, uh, like mouse with cat to where he, um, uh, he, he leaves, you know, clues and trails and, and really just a, a wake of destruction everywhere he goes. He's, he's not a hard um, creature to follow uh, because, you know, you just look for the burned village and there, you know, there he is. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the villagers say that, yes, uh, uh, giant ogre come in and, uh, you know, steal the sleds and, you know, the food and, and, and then just leave. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's probably him. You know, most likely, unless there is another eight-foot creature out there, I doubt it. So, Did you, were you ever close? Were you, were you ever like right there? Did you have a chance? Ah, uh, no. He, he. I see him on the horizon sometimes, and um, I chase him up through Russia, and um, you get to a certain point where I have to, uh, uh, you know, basically bust up my sled and you know turn it into oars, so as I can um, basically, you know, go. On an iceberg, like it's you know, like a, like it's some sort of boat, and try to you know to, to follow after him, and and, and that is uh, when uh, the, the captain you know eventually found me, and he said to me, you know, I told him my story. I said I'm, I'm searching for this creature. He says, ah, you know, we we saw him, you know, pass by in distance, you know, not so long ago, and um, so that I, close, that that close. I'm 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 right there. And he, he himself is trying to defy nature by, by going and finding North Pole. 
Right. Um, and uh, which seems like a very dangerous task to do, um, to defy nature in that, in that way, to try to overcome nature. You know, in speaking with Captain Walton, uh, I was I, I found myself stricken by his uh, his zeal, maybe going beyond zeal, his obsession to find the North Pole. I I find um, I find him to be very kindred spirit. Um, he he his relationship with me reminds me very very much of uh, the relationship I had with with Clairval. In the vein. Yeah, he, he he very much kindred spirit. Mm. Well, have you have you spoken to him about his obsession? Because obsession as a value, and I'm not even talking about what one might have an obsession about, the subject of the obsession, but obsession of a value from one person to another person essentially is the same. So have you spoken to him about the value of obsession or non-value of obsession um yes i mean he uh he wants to he wants to basically find north pole um and it is very much like my goal in order to um to uh uh build creature overcome death uh that was my goal overcome death and um both are both our goals of uh are in the face of nature in in in, and to uh, uh, to overcome this this nature, and so um, he he very interested in me, and we we both speak um, to each other, you know, for for a long time. And he uh, I I suppose he, he he said that he was making some some notes um, of of uh, my of of my tale, and so that he can he can write write some down and. Um, um, send them to his sister or something, mm. um, and so he, uh, so he's been writing these, you know, these things down. But um, it's it is almost as if I am trying to convince him that we need to go, you know, uh, chase after this creature. And the more I convince him, the more he starts to realize that maybe um, chasing the North Pole is not such a good idea after all. Well, and that brings me to a point. The weather has become nothing but more inclement all the way through this voyage. We're getting storms like we haven't seen. The crew is about to mutiny because they want Captain Walton to turn this ship around and and head south. That's what that's their desire. The, the crew is a is a bunch of sissy babies. They they need to they need to stay the course. Uh, they need uh, you know. Um, uh, Walton does not need to listen to his, to his crews. Um, he he needs to to stay course and, and and go forward. Well, on the precipice of this ship ship turning around and taking not only Walton away from his goal, but you away from your goal, what are your plans for the future? Well, I mean, if I mean, our my goal is to go north, and his his goal is to go north, and so we both go north together. But if he uh, if he changes his mind, I will uh, get uh, you know uh, get on by myself. I will you know he can uh, if if the ship uh, breaks from ice, um, you know he could go south, and if he goes south, I would uh, you know uh, try to find uh, supplies and uh, leave ship and go north because I I will find this creature. Do you have? We're right here. We're right now. A lot of people are listening. Do you have anything that you would like to share with those that might be listening to your words right here on this ship? I, I think that we all create our own monsters and that we look at technology as this way of salvation, this way of going forward and uh, how, uh, how Technology makes our life better. I thought that I would use, you know, galvanism and technology and to try to uh, make the world a better place. Um, but really, it is, it is not about that. It is about getting back to something more simple, uh, something that is uh, of nature. Um, that, and that, cause, and that, is, that will be our salvation. It's not this, uh, not this technology, not this, uh, uh, this internet, as you call it. Um, 
the I go on Suzy Facebook and it's just uh, a sounding board of hatred. And this is the sort of things that, you know, I see technology doing to us. It is tearing us apart. And what we need to do is to get back into something a little bit more simple. Uh, make it so that we can, you know, understand uh, what a face-to-face conversation is um, and get back to uh, a more simpler time. You know, it is, a, uh, it is about family. It is about friends, which once, I mean, you, you take them for granted. The people around you, you take them for granted. But when, when they are gone, that is when you miss them. And you, when you are around them, you should under, you know, you should um, embrace that moment of being with family, being with friends, and not searching for family and friends that don't, you know, that don't matter. Profound and beautiful, Mr. Frankenstein. So, one more sentence, one more sentence. We've been through a long journey. We've heard a huge story here. Some of it almost unbelievable to me and most likely to the listeners out in the world. What is the final thing that you, Victor Frankenstein, would like to say to the world. I, I need to make the depen- uh, penitence for what I have done. And I need to stop ignoring my problems and to actually, you know, finally follow through and do something about um, my sins. And I will um, chase after this creature and I will kill it. Um, and if um, if Walden turns and goes south, I will get off, and I will go north, and I will this cre- uh, I will destroy this creature. And if I do not, may God strike me dead. Thank you, Mr. Frankenstein. This has been a live interview aboard the ship of Captain Robert Walton, as he seems to be in the final throes of his explorative journey to find the North Pole. Mr. Frankenstein, thank you for spending a few minutes with us tonight. Ah, my, my, my pleasure. We wish you the best in your quest. Victor Frankenstein was played by my beyond brilliant friend, Professor Patrick Murphy who I've known and loved for decades. Patrick teaches psychology, AP psychology, and debate for the Weber School District. He also works as an adjunct instructor in the Department of Communication at Weber State University. Aside from Patrick's literary prowess, he's a pop culture fanatic. He spent the better part of two decades incorporating comic books, science fiction, and all things nerdy into his teaching curriculum. He's organized and participated in numerous panels at San Diego's Comic-Con International, spoke at academic conferences, and wrote a textbook on student-generated autobiographical comics. Murphy's number one goal is finding alternative paths to student engagement and learning. With any luck, we'll see Patrick in the studio again in the future. For tonight's song, since the Kickstarter for Tesla v. Cthulhu is currently underway, I thought I'd share something from the soundtrack. The musical opens up with Fritz Lowenstein, the historical assistant to Nikola Tesla during his Colorado Springs experiments, visiting a local tavern known as the Carronade. Fritz has had enough of the abuse piled on him by his boss. He's decided to quit, but his friend, Hercule, understands the importance of Tesla's work. He has other ideas for his friend, Fritz. Meanwhile, Alice, local telegraph operator, she rushes to the Carronade Tavern to pass along the message and weighs in on Lowenstein's drastic action against Tesla. I now give you, I quit.
to contract with the madman. Not so. Have you ever sold a portion of your soul? Come on, really? Or offered up your warmth to a hopeful confidant and been slowly taken down into the hole? What are you saying? If there ever was a chance for absolution, if there ever was a cause for a hot debate, it comes down to heat and cool, red hot raving of a fool with the cool collected genius of a grave. I quit. I've had enough of the overlordly slamming of a fist. He's an epic continental pool of monumental overrule, unbalanced, temperamental, and aloof. Surprised. He has magic powers at his fingertips. No, not really. To him, there is no night, no day, no object in his way. He's crowned with the corona of eclipses. You can't know the inner workings of delusion or the churn of hours spent turned like a screw. It's a quandary in my mind, and I've attempted to define the hair thin line between a genius and a fool. What's coming in? Strange signal, patchy and thin. All burgled. Has the sender lost his way? For the Morse code is so vague, I'll have to call Nate Slate and Truncate to translate. Minute. Danger. Go the. efficient blow. He's the prestidigitation of an egotistication fueled by unrequired and rampant bravado. You've come so far. It's a subject of debate, my friend. So far. You can't know the premium time I spent. You can't help to lift the cost of being insulted, touched, and tossed. You must let me on the This I hear on rambling must make it clear. Confounding, it can only be one source. Mr. Tesla, why, of course, he's in trouble in the bungle. Read his mars. Lightning, wood, and tower. Stop. Eminent danger, stop. Go the lightning wood and tower, stop. I have to find Lowenstein. You can't quit. It's a burden I of enormous it. care. You're the buttress holding up impact this shining of self-worth. 
Magnus when the man who's moving sky and earth grants a narrow birth to conquer. In the scheme of living, there is only so much to bear. I know that it may seem uncertain where I stand. Is exhausting. The illusion is a cost, and I don't think I can take it anymore. This has been the Terrifying Lies Podcast. Please, come again. You're welcome here. <laughs>